स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Holomorphic functions around its isolated singularities a bit further. In this lecture, we will state and prove uh, the residue theorem. Residue theorem broadly answers the following question: Suppose you have a function f which is holomorphic on an open set omega minus a set capital S, where capital S is a set of singularities, a discrete set of singularities. Then, uh, what can we say about the integral of f over gamma? where gamma is some curve in some closed curve in omega minus s basically a curve which doesn't pass through any of the points and singularities if you think about it carefully if capital s was empty and if our curve gamma was null homotopic this is just the cauchy's theorem the cauchy's theorem tells us that this integral is equal to zero so in some sense the residue theorem can be thought of as a generalization of the cauchy's theorem However, the presence of these singularities makes the answer to this question a bit more complicated and we will be answering that question in this lecture. Let me begin by defining uh, the residue of a function at a point z0. So, let me start by the definition of residue of a function at a point z0 at a singularity basically we are only the residue will be interesting only at uh, singularities in fact non removable singularities to be more precise let f from omega minus s into c be a holomorphic function let me set the premise for you where omega is an open set and s is a discrete subset of omega. So, notice that discrete ensures that each point of capital S is going to be an isolated singularity. Discrete basically means that if z0 is in, is in capital S, then there exists some R such so that d z0 R intersected with S is just the uh, set z0. No other point of S will be in such in that particular uh, neighborhood. So, suppose we have uh, a discrete subset. Then for z0 in capital S, uh, let d z0 R be let r positive be such that d z 0 r bar is contained in omega and d z 0 r intersected with capital S is the set S, uh, z 0. This is possible because our set capital S is discrete. Then in I should start with then for z 0 let this be the uh, the disk we are interested in then in d z 0 r minus z 0 in this annulus the punctured disk of radius r around z naught consider the Lorentz series expansion the Lorentz series expansion of f given by f of z is equal to summation n is equal to minus infinity to infinity a n z minus z 0 to the power n. So, suppose uh, we consider this disk and in this disk we will have a power series expansion or rather Lorentz series expansion of f in this manner. We define the residue of f at the point z 0 to be the coefficient of 1 by 1 z minus z naught the coefficient of uh, 1 by z minus z naught is special. Let me note it down. We define the residue of f at 
z0 to be a residue this is the notation residue of f at z0 this is the notation this is going to be defined as a minus 1 remember that uh, the moment we fix such a uh, such a annulus we have a uh, Laurent series expansion and in, in the given annulus this Laurent series uh, is unique and we even know exactly how to get hold of our uh, uh, our coefficients through the relevant integrals. So this definition makes sense even though it is a local definition it certainly makes sense and uh, the coefficient a minus 1 is called the residue of f at the point z0. Let us look at a few uh, cases rather than examples here. If z0 is a removable singularity, notice that z0 is just some point in capital S, it is hence just some isolated singularity and therefore it could be a removable singularity, it could be a pole, it could also be an essential singularity. Let us see what happens when it is a removable singularity. If z0 is a removable singularity, then by the classification theorem using the Laurent series, what do we have? Then a minus n is equal to 0 for all n in natural numbers. All positive integers n, you look at a minus n, that is going to be 0. That is the characterization of removable singularities using the Laurent series. And that tells us in particular that a minus 1 is 0 and hence the residue of f at z0 is equal to 0. So, in particular, if so, what is a removable singularity? A removable singularity is a singularity over which we can extend our function holomorphically. So, in some sense, the removable singularity behaves like any other point where our function is holomorphic, and hence the residue there is going to be like any other uh, point in the domain where it is indeed holomorphic. The residue at points where it is holomorphic is being put as 0 that is what this basically means. Let us look at when z0 uh, is a pole. So, if z0 is a pole of f, what happens if z0 is a simple pole uh, order 1, pole of order 1. Let us first consider this case of order 1. That means that f of z is equal to g of z by z minus z0 in dz0 r minus z0 where g does not vanish in this set dz0 r minus z0 if you want to shrink it further you can and finally assume that g does not vanish in this neighborhood at all by using the continuity of g g of z0 is not equal to 0 will be something which we have that is what is used to conclude that g will not vanish here by shrinking. But anyway the point is that this tells us that z minus z0 and we even have the explicit uh, uh, Laurent series expansion f of z will be going it will be something like a uh, okay, let us see this is going to be equal to z minus z0 is just going to be equal to uh, a0 plus a1 z minus z0 and so on. And therefore, f of z is just going to be equal to a0 by z minus z0 plus a1 and so on on the punctured disk. And this tells us that the residue of f at the point z0 is exactly equal to a0. But what was that? That was exactly equal to g of z0 which is not equal to 0, right. In fact, we could generalize this idea to an arbitrary order. In fact, if z0 is a pole of some order say m, then what will happen? Then we could write f of z as being equal to z minus I will just skip a few steps directly write this to be z minus z0 to the power m times g of uh, times f of z is equal to g of z where g has a removable singularity at z0 and after extending g of z0 is not equal to 0. In fact, g of z we will assume is not equal to 0 on dz0 
r minus z naught. Suppose this is what uh, uh, g is going to behave like. And then what do we have? Then the Lorentz series expansion of f, this is going to be equal to a0 by z minus z0 to the power m plus all the way up to a m minus 1 by z minus z0 plus a m and the remaining part. And therefore, the residue of f at the point z0 here, this is just going to be equal to a m minus 1. What was uh, a i's here, where g of z was equal to summation a n z minus z0 to the power n. That was what was used to conclude that the residue of f at the point z0 is a m minus 1. But we also know what is a m minus 1 in terms of g, isn't it? This is just uh, uh, g m minus 1 of z0 by m minus 1 factorial. Therefore, we can actually conclude the residue of f at z0 as being equal to 1 by m minus 1 factorial times the m minus 1 derivative of g at z0. In the case of essential singularity, we do not have uh, any easy way of concluding any of this. We will have to get down to maybe the Laurent series expansion and look at what the coefficient of 1 by z minus z0 is. All right, now that we have seen what the residue is, let me now state the residue theorem and we will then give a proof of the residue theorem. The residue theorem. The setup is going to be the same, let omega be an open subset of C and S, uh, let us put the restriction of finiteness on S, be a finite subset of omega. So, I would like to remark that we do not need to impose the stronger condition of S being a finite subset. S being discrete actually is more than enough to conclude this theorem, but we will then have to use a stronger machinery called the uh, Jordan curve theorem to conclude what we are concluding for the case when S is finite. So, let me avoid the reference to the stronger unproved theorems by putting this restriction here. So, let omega now be uh, open subset of C with a uh, finite subset capital S and suppose f be a function which is defined on omega minus S and is holomorphic there. Let us take a curve gamma which is both a closed curve and which is null homotopic in omega. Let gamma be a null homotopic closed curve in omega, not in omega minus s, we are demanding that it is in omega. Then the integral of 1 by 2 pi i f of z dz over gamma summation w gamma of z j where w gamma is the winding number of gamma around z j times the residue of f at the point z j. And what are the z j's? z j is the summation is from j equal to 1 to n where W where capital S is the finite set given by z1 to zn, maybe I should use a k here, zk. So, there are finitely many points as was observed earlier. So, let me enumerate them as z1, z2 up to zk and uh, w gamma is the winding number. Okay, so let me just go over the proposal, the theorem for you. We are 
considering a function f which is holomorphic on omega minus s where s is a set of singularities, isolated singularities. And if you look at the integral of f of dz over gamma, that is going to be equal to 2 pi i times the thing on the right which is basically the sum of w gamma of zj times the residue of f at zj. So, if you notice the residue is coming into the story in a very, very natural manner here. Let us give a proof of the residue theorem here. We will begin by defining a function g by capturing the residues of f at the various points zj's. So, define g of z to be equal, what is g of z equal to? g of z is equal to summation the residue of f at the point zj by z minus zj, again where j is from 1 to n. If you notice, uh, g is also a function which is holomorphic away from zj. So, notice that g is holomorphic on omega minus capital S, just like our small f. And moreover, if you look at g of z, let us focus on zj, fix zj and dzj r and r positive b such that dzj r bar is contained in omega and d z j r intersected with s is just the point z j. Suppose we have picked the right neighborhood around z j because it is an isolated singularity and we will be able to write our g of z j as the residue of f at the point z j by z minus z j plus the remaining term. I will capture with g1 of z and the observation here will be that then g1 is a function which has a removable singularity at zj. In fact, I will safely write it as being holomorphic on dzjr and therefore, if you look at the residue of g at the point say zj that is going to be equal to exactly the residue of f at the point zj. Why does uh, g1 have a uh, uh, holomorphic uh, expansion here? Why is g1 holomorphic here? That is because if you notice this term, there is only 1 z 1 by z minus zj term that appears in dzjr, no other singularity point in capital S appears and therefore, this function is very safe that it is a holomorphic function that whatever remains after taking out the residue of uh, f at the point zj by z minus zj from the expansion here, everything else is going to be holomorphic. Right. So, if you now write down the probability expansion of g1 and look at the definition of the residue, we get to conclude that the residue of g is the same as the residue of g. Now, further define capital F of z to be equal to f of z minus g of z. Now, what is the good thing about uh, our function capital F? Let us assume that the integral of capital F is 0. Let us assume that if the integral of capital F over gamma is equal to 0. Suppose we manage to prove this. Then that would imply that the integral of f of f minus g of z dz over gamma is equal to 0, is not it? And that would imply that the integral 1 by 2 pi a times the integral of f of z dz, this is exactly equal to 1 by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma of g of z dz. But computing the integral of g of z dz is quite straightforward because this is exactly uh, the sum of the residues of f at zj by z minus zj. This is precisely what our the, uh, function g is going to be, is not it? And uh, this is uh, again by the very definition uh, residue of 
f at the point zj. Notice that they are constants times this is the sum of this times the integral over gamma more than that it is 1 by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma dz by z minus zj where j is going from 1 to n and that is precisely whatever is written down in the brackets is exactly the winding number. This is w gamma of zj times the residue of f at zj and we would have completed the proof. So, the only thing to establish hence would be the thing which is put in the box here or maybe this box. So, the only thing that we need to conclude is that the integral of capital F uh, is equal to 0. Let us try proving that. To venture into proving that, let us try to first see how the uh, Lorentz series expansion of f turns out to be. Notice that uh, f of since f of z is equal to f of z minus g of z, we already have a Lorentz series expansion of uh, f around z naught around z j right. So, since this is the case in a neighborhood d z j r around uh, z j as above that means that ok maybe I should be around z j such that d z j are intersected with s is just z j. It is a small enough neighborhood that it intersects only at the uh, point z j and uh, d z j r bar is contained in omega. So, take one such there we have a Lorentz series expansion of f as well as g is not it. We know exactly how the Lorentz series expansion of g is going to be. Let me just write down then f of z is going to be equal to some summation a n z minus z j to the power n over there. We do not know what type of a singularity it is. So, let me just put the Lorentz series expansion this way and g of z we know exactly what the singularity is. It is going to be a simple pole at z j it has a pole of order 1 at z j. So, this is going to be residue of f at z j by z minus z j plus whatever remains is some g 1 which is a holomorphic function there which I will write it as b n z minus z j to the power n. So, this is precisely what we have. So, on the uh, disc on the punctured disc this is all on the punctured disc and the convergence is absolute here. So, the, the terms can be added and we will be able to hence conclude that capital F of z is going to be equal to summation n is equal to 2 to infinity. Notice that the residue here is exactly equal to a minus 1 which features here. So, the sum will tell the difference rather f x sorry f z minus g z is going to be the sum of a minus n z minus z j to the power minus n plus summation let me put a prime to denote that it is something like a n plus b n from 0 to infinity of z minus z j to the power n. And notice that this is a an absolutely convergent series and uh, the Lorentz series expansion is unique and this tells us that this is the Lorentz series expansion of capital F on the punctured disc. Let us now define the fact that there is no n equal to 1 in this uh, summation is of great advantage to us because we can explicitly write down an antiderivative of capital F on this punctured disc. Then on d z j r minus z j. Consider g of z to be defined in the following manner n equal to 2 to infinity a minus n z minus z j 
to the power minus of n plus 1 by minus of n plus 1. Notice how crucially we are using the fact that the n equal to 1 term does not feature here. And the second term anyway is fine that is going to be a n prime z minus z j to the power n plus 1 by n plus 1. If you consider this particular function then I will leave it as an exercise for you to sit down and check that this is also absolutely convergent. By, by using the fact that capital F is absolutely convergent and doing a comparison you can conclude that on this punctured disc capital G is also absolutely convergent. And for any z by picking a smaller analy uh, of uh, r1 and r2 where say 0 is less than r1 and r2 is less than r and such that r1 is less than r2 and z is in the analogs of r1, r2, the uniform conversion tells us that g prime of z is exactly equal to f prime of z. We can differentiate it term by term to get back function capital F here. So, in other words, notice that on the punctured disc capital G is a holomorphic function and therefore, in d z j r minus z j f has an antiderivative and that is good because if you now take any closed curve in d z j r minus z j hence if c is a closed curve in d z j r minus z j. Notice that I have slowly stopped using the word rectifiable because I am now talking about the integrals up to homotopy thanks to Pathe's theorem. What do we get to conclude here? By the second fundamental theorem of calculus, we have the integral of f over c is equal to 0. In fact, uh, these are at the points of singularities in the in the punctured disks around z j is what we are considering our integral of f over c. The other case if uh, z does not belong to or rather it belongs to omega minus capital S then uh, let r positive be such that d z r bar is contained in omega and d z r intersected with s is empty. So, you can always get hold of a small uh, disk of radius r around z which satisfies these conditions. Then by Cauchy's theorem, this is a simply connected domain and hence any simple closed curve is null homotopic and therefore by Cauchy's theorem integral of f over c is equal to 0 for every closed curve in d z r. So, what we have essentially established is that irrespective of which point we pick in omega whether it is in s or whether it is in omega minus s, we can either get hold of a punctured disc or we can get hold of a disc such that the integral of f over any closed curve uh, in the in the respective neighborhood is going to be 0 of our function capital. This is a very important observation. So, let me just put a star and a star star uh, for the purpose of finishing the proof. Okay, so, with this observation at the back of our head, let us try to now prove that the integral of f over a curve gamma is 0. So, let gamma from a b to omega minus s be null homotopic. What does it mean to say that it is null homotopic? It means that i e there exists capital H from 0 1 cross a b to omega. So, this is null homotopic in omega. Remember that the statement of the theorem only demanded that our curve be null homotopic in omega. Oh, I did not mention that. Ah, it is mentioned as closed curves 
in omega. So, the homotopy is in omega. So, let us take a homotopy capital H uh, so into omega. So, that is precisely what it means. There is a continuous function such that H 0 comma uh, uh, such that gamma 0 is equal to gamma and gamma 1. I am just using our notation from earlier. This is some gamma z naught where gamma z naught of t is equal to z naught for all t in a v. So, we end up with a constant curve at some point z naught that is what it means and where gamma s is and such that gamma s is a closed curve for every s in 0 1. So, this is precisely what it means for our curve gamma to be null homotopic. Now, 0 1 cross omega is a compact subset of R 2 right. Since 0 1 cross omega uh, not omega a b is compact, so is uh, h of 0 1 cross omega because continuous functions preserve the property of being compact. So, this is going to be a compact subset uh, in omega and uh, we consider the cover u prime let u prime be the cover of all the neighborhoods as above. This is going to be uh, d the co collection of all d z r z may be such that uh, z does not belong to capital S d z r z bar is contained in omega and d z r z intersected with s is empty. Notice that this is the exact collection of uh, neighborhoods where our capital F had the property that its integral over any closed curve is 0. So, we will take the union of this with what happens when it is in s. So, this is not in s I will just change it to oh I will just put z in h of 0 1 cross a b minus s. I do not want for every point in omega it is just in the image that we will consider union the collection of all d z j r z j such that z j 1 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to k d z j uh, r maybe I will just put an r j here r j bar intersected with uh, s is the set z j and d z j r j bar maybe I will put this extra assumption that the uh, points in s does not belong to the closure that can also be arranged right. It's uh, just going down to a smaller set if needed. So, this is the exact collection. So, I have not, not done uh, even though I have written it in this manner not done anything new I have just captured those neighborhoods where star and star star are being satisfied. If you go up and check that is precisely uh, the, the collection that is being considered and this is going to be an open cover of uh, h of 0 1 cross a b because we are doing this for every point there oh, where uh, this is the case and uh, z j belongs to capital S if z, uh, z j belongs to h of 0 1 cross a b. If it is not in the image we will not be interested let us only consider those points in the image of h under image of 0 1 cross a b under h. Right, so uh, being compact by compactness, we get a finite subcover like u, which I will denote it by 
u1 to un let me not try singling it out be a finite subcover and further because this is a cover of our uh, image of 0 1 cross ab under h there exists a Lebesgue number we will denote that Lebesgue number by epsilon okay subcover and let epsilon be the Lebesgue number corresponding to u. Now, what is the uh, good thing about u? If you take any uh, closed curve in u1 or u any closed curve in u1 u2 to un which is not going through the point of singularity if it is around a singularity then the integral of capital F over c is going to be 0 that is precisely what star and star star above had ensured. Now, we are going to use that and the fact that uh, our h is uh, a continuous function on a compact set implies that it is uniformly continuous will be used to get hold of a partition of 0 1 cross a b. Let me just note what I just said by uniform continuity. So, so if you recall the proof of uh, Cauchy's theorem that we proved some time back, you will notice that we are actually going down the same rabbit hole, it is not very different. The proof is actually mimicking the proof there, but we have to be a little careful about the singularity that is precisely what we will be doing. By uniform continuity, there exists a delta positive such that the absolute value of h of s uh, t minus h of s prime t prime, this absolute value is less than say epsilon by 4 whenever absolute value of s minus s prime is less than delta and absolute value of t minus t prime is less than delta. If both these conditions are satisfied, we can ensure that h of s comma t minus h of s prime comma t prime is less than epsilon by 4. Okay, let us now as I was mentioning, let us now mimic the proof of Cauchy's theorem. Let us get hold of a partition of 0, 1 and a, b. Consider the partitions. zero equal to s zero less than s one up to say s n which is equal to one and a equal to t zero less than t one less than up to t n equal to b such that the uh, the partition size in both the cases is less than delta thereby ensuring that h of s i t j minus h of s i minus 1 t j is less than epsilon by 4 that is being ensured or for that matter the other variable as well. But not just that we also demand a little more. So, let me just draw a picture before uh, describing the uh, other demand. So, suppose we have a closed curve of this type. So, suppose this is the point z0 and uh, I'm going to draw the sj's using different colors. So, let me use red to draw some s1, pink is to draw maybe green like green is to draw s2 and uh, violet is to draw s3. I cannot draw more closed curves in a clean manner. So, let me stop there. Uh, let me use orange to capture tj's. We have tj's
So we have partitioned our SJs and SIs and TJs in this manner. And what our uh, demand will be uh, is the following. You look at the blue polygonal parts. So this is the arrow. Our demand will be that if you take any such polygonal path, it will not have a point of the singularity. Notice that because our set of uh, singularities is finite by perturbing SJs and TJs, if needed, we can always ensure this. So let me just note what I just said such that for every i, comma j such that one is or rather yeah, 1 is less than or equal to i is less than or equal to n and 1 is less than or equal to j is less than or equal to m. If you look at gamma c i j, which is gamma polygonal path s i t j, this is s i t j coming down to uh, s i t j minus 1. going then to s i minus 1 t j minus 1 then going up to h s i minus 1 t j and then going back to s i t j. If you look at this polygonal path, this polygonal path does not intersect capital S. So, in none of these polygonal paths do we have any point of our singularity. That is what is being ensured by the partition. So, we were picking a partition. Remember that we were trying to get hold of a partition here. The partition had the following properties. Let me repeat the properties. It has the mesh size or the partition size less than delta. Uh, the delta was corresponding to the epsilon that we picked here. And further that if needed you can perturb SJ, SJs and TIs so that none of the CJs have any point of CIJs have any point of capital S. This much we can always ensure. And once we have this recall by a similar argument. as given in Cauchy's theorem, we get to conclude that the integral of, so if the integral of f over c i j is equal to 0 for all i comma j, then the integral of f over gamma 0 minus the integral of f over gamma 1 is just going to be equal to the sum of the integral of f over c i j where i come i is going from uh, 1 to n and j is going from 1 to m. Further each of this is going to be equal to 0. Oh that we have not concluded this is precisely what we get to conclude. We are going to now conclude. Uh, let me write down the claim. Oh, what was gamma 0 here? Gamma 0 was just gamma and gamma 1 is just gamma z0, the constant curve. So, we will come back to this. Let me call this star star or let me not call it anything. The claim is to show that integral o of c i j of f of z d z is equal to 0 for all i comma j. We have done all the hard work here because if you notice, uh, notice that the arc length of C i j is going to be less than epsilon. Further, which tells us that the diameter of C i j hat, the convex hull that is also going to be less than epsilon, which tells us that C i j hat is contained in some u, u for some u in script u. What was script u? Let me just go up and show you what script u was. Script u was a finite subcover such that if you look at 
any closed curve in this manner or any closed curve in this manner, the integral of f over that closed curve is 0. It is precisely how we picked our script u, is not it? And uh, the fact that we perturbed our SJs if needed to ensure that it does not intersect capital S, these, these uh, curves CIJs do not intersect capital S, the precautions was taken in order to conclude that the integral of f over c i j is going to be 0. By star, let me put it this way, by star and star star and the fact that c i j does not intersect capital S, we have, we can hence implement star star if needed and we get to conclude that the integral of f over cj, cij is 0. But then let us go up here and let us look at the equation that I have just underlined in green. The right hand side is the sum of the integral of f over all cijs and let me now put a star 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 here to refer it below. Hence by star 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 we have the integral of f over gamma is the same as the integral over gamma z0 which is the constant path which is equal to 0 and that is precisely what we were trying to conclude. So, let me note here that we have just established that the integral of small f is the same as the integral of capital F and uh, we had given what happens when this is equal to 0, is not it? We have we had noticed that then the integral of f over gamma 1 by 2 pi i times that is exactly equal to this, which we were expected to conclude. 